Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here and to have a chance to visit Kansas City for a little while. It's a, it's a beautiful city, also a historic one. Mm. So if you can't see this figure, this slide, very well in the background, don't worry, I made it uh, blurry on purpose. So hopefully, <laughs> it was sort of an artistic thing. Hopefully, the, the rest of them won't, won't be quite like this. Um, I'm going to ask you, I know you have pieces of paper, but I'm going to ask you if you do have a writing implement, a pen or a pencil, uh, can you find it in the, while, while I'm blabbering for the next minute or so? Because there's going to be a quiz to start with. Um, I'm going to give you eight statements about earthquakes and ask you to jot down or just, if you don't have a pen or pencil, don't worry, none of this matters. Um, just <laughs> think about your own answer about whether or not these statements are fact or fiction. And then I'm going to go through the statements and uh, we'll see how it goes. When I first put together this, started to put together this talk, I was sort of thinking along the lines of the usual outreach talks that I give. Um, and then I decided that maybe we could have a little bit of fun with it and play Mythbusters. Now, I don't know if you've seen this show. Um, it's, it's pure genius, and I, I'm not claiming that I'm going to come close to, to what they're able to pull off. Um, but <laughs> I think maybe we can have some fun along the way. So, okay. Eight statements, and if you, if you do have a pen or pencil, if you just jot down for each one, fact or fiction. And some of them you might want to think about, or you might want to, you know, you might have a question about, and um, too bad, you just have to take your best shot um, and, and come up with an answer. So the first one is, the Mississippi River ran backwards during the 1811-1812 New Madrid earthquakes. Fact or fiction? And you get about five seconds to decide, <laughs> maybe seven. Church bells rang in Boston during the 1811-1812 New Madrid earthquakes. You may have heard that. Three, uh, the 1811-1812 sequence included the largest earthquakes ever witnessed in the contiguous 48 United States. Okay, whoops, that was a little fast. I should give you five seconds to think about it. Um, recent moderate earthquakes in the central United States have been caused by hydraulic fracturing, or what we call fracking. Five, the advent of widespread unconventional oil recovery techniques, or fracking, is responsible for the increase in earthquake activity in the heartland. And you're thinking, wait a minute, that sounds a lot like four, but again, just give it your best shot. Uh, six, with the increase in induced earthquakes, seismic hazard in Oklahoma is as high as hazard in California. If you've seen the, the, the terrific display in back here, you may actually have thoughts about that one. You may have informed thoughts about that one. Uh, seven, earthquakes are not a concern, natural earthquakes are not a concern in the central United States outside of the New Madrid seismic zone. And eight, Building resilient structures is too expensive given the low level of earthquake risk in the central United States. Better to spend money on other things. So if you haven't written anything down, uh, hopefully you've made a mental note of what, whether you think uh, these are fact or fiction. So I'm going to be talking uh, through the first part of the talk quite a bit about the New Madrid seismic zone, the New Madrid sequence, which happened over the winter of 1811-1812. Uh, this is a contemporary woodcut uh, of the effects uh, of that, uh, those earthquakes. Um, so the sequence actually included four large earthquakes uh, starting about 2.30 in the morning local time, December 16th, 1811, then what we call the dawn aftershock, a quite large event, and then two more large events, January 23rd, 1812, and what's been called the hard shock. Uh, by all accounts, the largest event was February 7th, 1812. And the New Madrid uh, sequence looms large in any discussion of hazard in, in the heartland um, for a couple of reasons. This, this map is also part of the display. Uh, Eric and I actually didn't compare notes, but I was interested to see that some of the, a couple of the um, images that he just used are the exact same ones that I've included in, in this talk. Um, so you can see the New Madrid seismic zone here. It, it's centered in the boot heel part of Missouri. Um, 
And it, it looms large, uh, both because of the, um, the, the hazard it poses in the immediate area, but it also generates a fair amount of hazard away from New Madrid proper. And so way over here in western Missouri, New Madrid is most of the reason why hazard is it's not high, but it's not as low as it is in other areas. That's mostly because we're close enough to New Madrid to, to be affected by it here. Um, and so I wanted to mention one important thing about earthquakes in the central U.S. Um, that's quite well known, and this is a, a recent picture that I put together, that because of the way the, the structure of the Earth's crust, earthquakes, waves travel, as, as the introduction said, much more efficiently in the east than in the west. So if you can see this, the colors wash out a little bit. But these are shaking intensities from a magnitude 5.8 earthquake in Virginia, the earthquake in 2011. And you can see how widely it was felt compared to a magnitude 6 in California. So same size earthquake, but the shaking just travels much farther. So for that reason, if you have a big earthquake in Missouri or in Oklahoma, um, you may feel it several hundred miles away. So that's one of the, the issues that we contend with here. So that's just a little bit of background. Well, let's get to the first um, statement. The Mississippi River ran backwards during the 1811-1812 uh, New Madrid earthquakes. So let me talk about the, the New Madrid earthquakes a little bit. Um, this is a modern view of the New Madrid seismic zone. You can see the boot heel of, of Missouri. You can see the uh, Mississippi River. Maybe you can see it winding down here. And these are little earthquakes that have been recorded in uh, relatively modern times, the red dots. And so um, our understanding is that there's two main faults that are part of this zone. There's a, uh, what we call a strike-slip fault to the south, which is where the two sides of the fault move laterally relative to one another. And then you have this real foot fault, which is a, what we call a thrust fault. And so that is, if you can see this little inset, a thrust fault angles down through the crust, sort of like this. And when an earthquake happens, it's, it's because, stop that, because the, the, the crust is basically pushed together. So if you look at my elbows, they move together and the fault moves, one side moves up relative to the other. So at the real foot, in, uh, there's pretty good evidence, quite good evidence, that this is the fault that moved in the February earthquake. This side moved up, the southwest side moved up relative to the northeast side. So if we look in on the New Madrid seismic zone using Google Earth, which is an amazing thing, uh, you can see the bend in the Mississippi. Uh, this is a little historic map that showed where New Madrid was <coughs> here. It's still uh, essentially in the same place. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the, the real foot fault cuts across um, as shown here. So in this February earthquake, this side moved up and over <clears throat> this side, and the motion at the Earth's surface was about two meters or six feet. We don't know exactly. Um, but what happened, because you moved this side up, is that you created a dam that created Real Foot Lake down here. Uh, where it crossed here, you actually created waterfalls uh, going downstream. And then, in this location, you created a dam across the river that actually did send the current running backwards for, for a short amount of time. It didn't reverse the course for, for a long time, but it did temporarily. And in fact, we've seen examples of, of earthquakes creating waterfalls um, and such in recent times, uh, including the 1999 earthquake in Taiwan, which created this very dramatic waterfall where the fault uh, crossed a river, so this side went up. So, getting back to this statement, this is actually not a myth. We can, we can confirm it. Um, the current wasn't reversed for, for a long period of time, but for a short period. It was, and boat, boatmen on the river documented having that the current flowed backwards. So, okay. Church bells rang in Boston during the 1811-1812 New Madrid earthquakes. So, uh, to answer this, I'm going to talk a little bit about the earthquakes and what we know about them and how we know it. Uh, these earthquakes not only 
predated the invention of seismometers. They invented essentially the advent of photography. So we don't even have uh, photographs of the effects. Um, so how do we know about them? One of the important ways we know about them, well, I mean, this is a, this is a map. You may have seen something like this that shows the shaking uh, mapped out uh, with different colors. So this goes back to seminal work by Otto Nutley in 1973. Uh, and you can see strong shaking and then weaker shaking, et cetera. So uh, what this, maps like this are plotting is what we call intensity. So magnitude is a measure of earthquake size. You know, a certain earthquake has a one magnitude. But intensity is an older measure, and actually the display talks about this in back. Intensity measures the severity of shaking in any one place from a given earthquake. And in very general terms, this is what the intensity scale looks like. If you barely feel shaking, that's intensity two or three. If there's very light damage, um, say to weak chimneys, that might be intensity six, whereas really catastrophic shaking is up here at intensity 10. So nowadays, uh, if you've ever seen the USGS Did You Feel It system, if you feel an earthquake, you can go to the internet, you can fill out a questionnaire, did you feel the earthquake, did other people feel it, were there sounds, and the, there's an algorithm that'll take your answer, generate an intensity, and generate a map like this, uh, for a large earthquake. So we have quite detailed intensity maps. And uh, one note is this, this map is not showing peak acceleration or anything like that. It is showing these same intensity values over here. So if you're looking at a historic earthquake, how do we know anything about them? Well, one of the important ways is you go to archival sources to see what people wrote down at the time about how the earthquake was felt and, and what happened. They didn't go to the internet in 1811. Um, but you find, if you look at newspapers, diaries, um, letters, you find accounts. For example, this one. And so this is from Cincinnati, Ohio, for the first New Madrid earthquake. So Cincinnati is some distance. It's about four, four or 500 kilometers from New Madrid. Um, the earthquake, the shaking was so violent as to agitate the loose furniture of our rooms open partition doors that were fastened with falling latches and throw the tops off a few chimneys in the vicinity of town. And that's a fairly severe level of shaking. And that was used by this uh, 1973 study to determine an intensity of six, which is a pretty healthy level of shaking. And so this is one of the data points that was used to draw these big balloon contours. This yellow is intensity six that's extending up uh, well into Columbus, Ohio, for example. Um, one of the things I've, I've, well, I've done a lot of work on historic earthquakes throughout my career, going back to 1999, and, and the reason I got into it, interested in it, was actually this very account. Um, I was doing research for my first book, and I just wanted to talk about the New Madrid earthquakes and what people said about them, and I went to the original uh, archival source, and I found the quote that had been interpreted in the early study, and then I found it didn't end there, that it continued. And the same author said it, that the shaking was stronger in the valley of the Ohio River than in the adjoining uplands. Many families living on the elevated ridges of Kentucky, not more than 20 miles from the river, slept during the shock, which cannot be said, perhaps, of any family in town. So on the elevated ridges of Kentucky, people were sleeping through the shaking, and that implies intensity four. So um, again, doing a lot of work on these accounts, I've come up most recently with, with this map of what the intensities were for this, just the first large earthquake in December. You can see some high values, but they were interspersed with a lot of lower values. Um, and you, it's quite a bit different from these great big balloon contours. Um, and if you read the Boston newspapers, there is no evidence that the earthquakes were even felt there. So uh, I actually have a theory for where, so it, we're gonna bust this myth, um, but I have a theory for where this myth came from. I can't prove it, uh, but I think I'm right. Uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, there is a solid account that the vibrations of St. Philip's steeple uh, 
caused the clock bell to ring for about 10 seconds. So the shaking caused church bells to ring in Charleston. The theory is that Charleston turned into Charlestown, turned into Boston. So church bell rang in Boston, church bells rang in Boston during the, the New Madrid sequence, busted. And if you don't remember anything else from t tonight, I hope you'll remember this because it's still repeated um, in, by sources that, that should know better. Okay, so the 1811, the New Madrid earthquakes were the largest earthquakes in the contiguous United States. Um, I've already given you some clues about what the answer is gonna be. Um, the, there were interpretations of uh, accounts like this, and then also of geologic observations of sand blows that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but based on the initial interpretation, it seemed like the effects had really been portentous, that they had been st the earthquakes had been strongly felt throughout most of the, the uh, United States as it existed. This, is, um, this account is from Daniel Drake. This is his house in, in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, but there were some estimates of magnitude that were upwards of magnitude eight, and at one point as high as eight and three quarters, which would have made these the, the biggest earthquakes ever witnessed in the contiguous U.S. But by the time you look more carefully at the, the original sources, and, and then you consider what the country looked like in 1812, where people were living, um, the settlement patterns, and people were living along the river valleys because that's what they could get to easily, so they were preferentially living in places where shaking gets amplified because you're sitting on river sediments. That's something that we've known for a long time. So um, basically, these early interpretations, and this was an important seminal study, but it, it went wrong for a couple of reasons. Um, there was no consideration of the settlement patterns or the demographics. And then um, also some of the intensity assignments were overly biased by subjective accounts. You have accounts where people were very frightened, where the accounts are very dramatic, but when you bore down to what, well, what really happened? You know, did a, did a, your dish fall off the table or was your chimney damaged? Then you find the, 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 the evidence for some of the strong shaking um, kind of wasn't as, well, the, the evidence didn't support some of the assignments that had been made. So um, my preferred Es magnitude estimates for these earthquakes are low magnitude sevens uh, and not, uh, not close to magnitude eight and certainly not the, the largest earthquakes in the contiguous U.S. So me personally, at least, um, I consider that one busted. Now, uh, at this point, I need to add that some of my work has been controversial in the scientific community. There are people who've argued that, no, they really were magnitude 7.7. .7 earthquakes, I don't think that's really supported. Um, but another point is that, you know, even if these earthquakes were only magnitude seven, we don't have to look back very far in time to see um, very dramatic evidence of what a magnitude seven earthquake can do in a region that's not well prepared for earthquakes. And you may recognize this was Haiti in 2010, um, and their earthquake was a 7.0. So, okay, now let's move forward to the present day and some earthquakes that um, may have been a concern. I, I understand that some of the bigger earthquakes in Oklahoma have been felt here in, in Kansas City. Um, so four, uh, the statement is, recent earthquakes in the central U.S. have been caused by uh, fracking, hydraulic fracturing. So let's talk about the, some of the recent earthquakes. Um, this is a, a figure that shows the number of earthquakes bigger than magnitude three in Oklahoma, and I'm gonna be picking on Oklahoma here um, because that's uh, where, where most of the data comes from. I'm not really gonna be talking about Kansas where the induced earthquake issue is, has been less, um, less of an issue or elsewhere. But in, in Oklahoma, going back to 1979, there was a low level of, of small earthquakes, and all of a sudden, Around 2009, kind of all heck broke loose and you started to get these big numbers. The red dots here are earthquakes that have been recorded. Uh, I'm, I'll ignore the black dots for now. So something appears to have changed in 2009-ish. Um, and uh, here's another figure that shows, this is again the number of magnitude 
three or greater earthquakes uh, in California versus Oklahoma. I showed this once and said, and somebody asked me, did, you, did somebody on purpose make California blue and Oklahoma red? <laughs> Not that I know of. <laughs> um, but you can see that around 2014, California started to be a more quaky place. Uh, Oklahoma started to be a more quaky place than uh, even California. So one of the studies I did uh, a couple years ago was to look back at the earthquake catalog in Oklahoma and to figure out what you could say about earthquake activity going back before 1970, 1980, all the way to 1900. So this is, again, counting the magnitude three and a half or greater earthquakes. Through time, you can see that there have been some active, relatively active periods. But then you can see that what, what's gone on recently really has blown everything else out of the water. So things really have been different. And there was a lot of um, immediate suspicion that that had everything to do with, with what we call fracking. So you, you've probably um, heard um, about fracking. Uh, it's a process where you drill directionally into an oil shale formation. So shale is a rock that has um, uh, oil trapped in it, but in such a tight matrix, you can't just drill a conventional well and pump oil. Uh, if you drill that directionally, inject fluids down, break the rock, that will free up, the, liberate the oil and gas, and then you can, um, you can actually produce oil. And so um, fracking really got, fracking wasn't new in, in 2009, but it really got, um, it really um, became widespread. Uh, in the years after 2000 in a way that it hadn't before. So two other cartoons that show the um, first you fracture the well and then you produce uh, from this formation. But the key thing here is if you notice or if you can see, this is the production formation, the, the oil shale that you're targeting. And then you, so you have layers of sediments that have built up over millions of years. And that's where the hydrocarbons are because dinosaurs and whatever got trapped. Uh, the crystalline basement rock is where significant earthquakes are generated. That's where you have faults, that's where stresses build up and, and, the, and stresses can be released in earthquakes. And the key point is that the, the breaking up rock is, in a, you are causing earthquakes. I mean, you're, you're breaking the rock, you do get little earthquakes but it's all at a different depth range than where natural earthquakes are generated. So I'm, I'm, there's a, I could talk for three hours about this alone, but there's a lot of work that's been done looking at these earthquakes, uh, where the fracking is. And there is some evidence that, that fracking has induced earthquakes. Some earthquakes in some areas, uh, small earthquakes in Ohio, say, and some earthquakes in Western Canada. Uh, but by and large, fracking per se is not generating the big upswing in earthquakes that we see in Oklahoma and elsewhere. So we're going to bust that one. But, haha, this is where the more carefully worded statement <laughs> comes in. The advent of fracking is responsible for many recent earthquakes in, in the heartland. And now you're thinking, okay, what the frack? Um, I just said, it wasn't true, but no, I, I've chose, I'm a writer, I chose my words carefully. Um, so let's look at the fracking process. You, you drill down, you inject water into uh, this formation, then you pull the oil out, but you also pull, you end up pulling that wastewater. You pull out water that is essentially uh, wastewater. You have to get rid of it somehow, and the way we get rid of it is to in inject it into the crust into a disposal formation that's below the freshwater aquifers. And so the, in, the disposal formations are, are deeper than the production formations is one important point. So now I, I sort of want to talk a little bit about wastewater injection and go back in time to make, and this, this is an early picture from Oklahoma where the, the early oil booms were, oil boom was in the early 
20th century, but I wanted to make the point that wastewater or saltwater disposal is nothing new. Any time you produce oil, there's a small amount or a bigger amount of co-produced water, and in some cases, a secondary recovery technique is used where water is injected to flush out uh, more oil from a formation, and that produces more water. So you've, uh, oil production has always produced wastewater. It's typically very uh, salty or briny, um, and it's traditionally been called uh, salt water. For example, it can have a lot of chemicals in it, additionally. So early on in the early 20th century, the, the answer to wastewater disposal was to put it in storm drains, storm drains in some places, or uh, in other places, including Oklahoma, to just dispose of it in open pits, like this one. Well, um, that caused problems because cows would come along and drink the water, and yeah, <laughs> they would die. So um, that led to unpleasant things like dead cows and lawsuits. So uh, industry pretty quickly moved away from this and towards injection of wastewater in relatively deep disposal wells. So, so wastewater injection wasn't anything new uh, since 2000, 2005, but things did change with the advent of hydraulic fracturing. This is a plot, there's a lot going on here. Um, this is the injection rate, or sorry, how much, it's essentially, well, injection rate, yeah. Um, through time, from the 1990s, the blue is the volume that was injected, and you can see that it went up around 2005. Uh, the other thing that went up was the number of high uh, injection rate wells. So you had a lot of wastewater, more of it was going into these wells, um, and in, in some cases at, at faster rates of injection. And again, I'm skipping all the gory details, but I'll, I'll tell you that the result of an, a lot of research looking at this is that this injection has, is the, the bad actor. Um, so what happens is you, you have the wastewater, it's going into uh, deep disposal wells, what we call class two wells, that increases the fluid pressure at depth. So it's like taking a soda can and shaking it up. You, the pressures go up if you push uh, fluid into a formation that, that's down at depth somewhere. And if there's a fault, if these, um, so this is relatively deep, it's getting closer to the basement where you have faults and stresses build up. If you happen to have a fault nearby and you increase the fluid pressure, that will reduce the effective friction on the fault. You can think of it as lubricating the fault. It isn't quite direct lubrication, but it, it's similar to that. And that, we think, is what can give you earthquakes. Now, overwhelmingly, it's not like you drill an injection well and you're going to get earthquakes. It would, that's um, Most injection wells are not associated with significant induced earthquakes, but, but some of them are. So this statement, as worded, um, is basically confirmed. Okay, so with the increase in induced earthquake seismic hazard in Oklahoma is comparable to hazard in California, and you might think I've answered that because I've, sh I've shown you this, that Oklahoma has been outquaking California. Uh, these are magnitude three or greater earthquakes. And then another figure that's in the display in back, uh, great minds do think alike. Um, this is a map that the USGS produced. Uh, this was the first one in 2016 that maps the hazard over one year uh, from, so this is the same calculation for the West where we assume that earthquakes are, are occurring naturally versus the East where hazard is a little bit from New Madrid but mostly from these induced earthquakes. And if you look at this, it looks like Oklahoma is indeed more hazardous than California. There's a bigger red area here than there. But when you see any map like this, um, you have to ask, you know, what exactly do we mean by hazard? You know, what, what is earthquake hazard? How do you come up with one color uh, to put on a map? And th there's a lot of decisions that go into making a map like this. So in this case, the decision was to 
map out the probability of the chance of seeing intensity six shaking. So that's the kind of shaking that might damage a weak chimney, for example. And what are the odds of seeing intensity six in, in throughout the Midwest? And if you can, you probably can't read this, but the red is, um, it's a one in 10 to a one in 20 chance. So it, it's a decent chance that you're gonna see intensity six over a wide area, which, which sounds sort of alarming. Um, but that's intensity six. And that is resulting from the fact that you're having a whole lot of magnitude four earthquakes, four and a half, a few fives, um, which we've had a lot of in, in Oklahoma. Or the, the, lower, the number's actually gotten lower this year, but for a while, Oklahoma was really cooking along. But now let's look at the magnitude five or greater earthquakes. And that's a different picture. If you, this is an awful slide, and I apologize, I, I didn't, wasn't able to put together a better one, but hopefully you can see the United States, the circles are magnitude five or greater earthquakes. This inset, which I'm sure you cannot see the outline of Oklahoma's in there somewhere. These are all the magnitude uh, three and a half or greater earthquakes in Oklahoma. And this is why um, you're getting a, a high chance of lightly damaging shaking. But if you look at the number of magnitude fives that's happened from between 2009 and, and 2017, uh, you find there have been four in Oklahoma. There's been one natural earthquake over here in Virginia. Uh, this guy in Colorado is, is likely induced. Uh, but then you've had all these magnitude five and greater earthquakes in the West that are associated with natural uh, plate tectonic forces. And so overwhelmingly, the overall energy release uh, which controls the hazard is still dominated by natural earthquakes and the hazard is still concentrated in the West and Oklahoma doesn't take that title away from, from California. So uh, this statement, uh, you can quibble, uh, but I think basically uh, it's busted, that in the, in the ways that matter, Oklahoma is not as dangerous um, in terms of earthquake hazard as, as California is. Okay, so now let's talk about, uh, go back to talking about natural earthquakes. Um, apart from New Madrid, and, and I've thrown in Charleston, earthquakes are not a concern. Natural earthquakes are not a concern in the central United States. Fact or fiction? So uh, in the 1960s, scientists developed the theory of plate tectonics. It's a basic framework paradigm that, that sort of explains um, the earthquake machine, the Earth's crust, uh, the upper tens of miles is, are broken into these big pieces that we call plates. They move around on top of the, the mantle below, and uh, they move past each other along plate boundaries that you can see here, including the Pacific Rim. The Mid-Atlantic Spreading Center, or Mid-Atlantic Ridge, you have the two sides spreading apart. Uh, in a lot of places, you have the seafloor sinking in Japan, South America. And then in a few places, the plates move sideways relative to one another. And um, I was interested to see a very early map of, of earthquake zones from a book by Robert Mallet in the display in back. Uh, this was from 1850, before scientists had any idea about plate tectonics. But you could see that even back then, it was known that earthquakes are lining up in these fairly narrow belts that we now understand are the active uh, plate boundaries. And so if you're sitting in the middle of, of a continent away from an active plate boundary, um, you're going to have less earthquake activity, certainly. Um, but you still do have earthquakes. I've shown you this already. Um, the New Madrid seismic zone, Charleston, where we've had big earthquakes historically and, and prehistorically. The um, Eastern Tennessee seismic zone, where we've had a, a relatively high number of small earthquakes the central Virginia seismic zone, which produced the 2011 earthquake. So even though most of the stress is concentrated to the west along the active plate boundary, you still have sort other sources of stress anywhere um, in the crust. One of the issues in, in uh, North America is this mid-Atlantic ridge, which is pushing half of the Atlantic and North America 
to the west, and that's generating a low level of what we call ridge push, which is basically compressing things at a low rate. But there are other sources of stress as well um, from, from, different, um, from different forces that are going on. Uh, you can have stresses, local stresses in the crust because of erosion. Um, you can have stresses in the crust because the uh, ice sheets went away at the end of the last ice age, and they were, during the last ice age, the ice sheets were pushing down the crust. When they go away, the crust starts to rebound, the same way a cushion would if you put your hand on it, but that process is very slow, and it, that's thought to, to be generating uh, some of the earthquakes that we see today. And we don't actually fully understand the sources of stresses uh, throughout the mid-continent, but we know they're there, we know earthquakes um, are there. Um, so I just wanted to sort of throw in a, a slide about, go back to New Madrid. Um, we know the New Madrid, and this, there's a lot going on here, um, but we know the New Madrid seismic zone has been uh, cooking along for at least a few thousand years. Um, it wasn't just the 1811-1812 the sequence and then it's, it's gone back to sleep. Uh, and we know this from geologic uh, observations and a body of work that was led by my colleague Tish Tuttle. So um, one of the way, this is one of the ways that we're able to study older earthquakes is to look at what we call sand blows or liquefaction. And in some settings, if you get an earthquake and there's uh, saturated sands at some level near the surface, if you shake them hard enough, they, they lose their cohesion and they get pushed up to the surface. And they basically act like a liquid and they leave literally a, a sand blow that you can see on the surface comes up through the overriding layers. And you, if you look at air photos, you can still see these things from 1811, 1812. But if you dig down through the strata, you can find evidence for older ones. There's sand blows that were around 1450 AD. 900 AD, and then some uh, less, the evidence gets less good as you go down, it's harder to study them, but there were prehistoric earthquakes going back to about 2500 BC. Um, so we know New Madrid has been cooking along, um, but there is evidence throughout the mid-continent of other big earthquakes in prehistoric times. This is a fault, a scarp, what we call in Mears, Oklahoma, which is well away from oil production, past or, or present. This is uh, more towards western Oklahoma. And if a fault breaks, it's big enough, it comes all the way to the surface, you can generate a, a scarp like this. Uh, this feature is thought to have been caused by one or two earthquakes about 3,000 years ago, with magnitudes close to seven. Um, this isn't the best slide. The, the, this is Missouri. Uh, the boot heel, the new measured seismic zone is here. Uh, there's been a, a quite large sand blow that's been investigated down near Mariana that uh, also must have been generated by uh, quite a large earthquake. So these are just two examples. There's others that I could show, but in the interest of time, I'll just show these to make the point that, yeah, there have been, in prehistoric times, earthquakes up to magnitude 7, not, not only in the New Madrid seismic zone. So this one we are going to bust. But then, yes, but uh, earthquakes aren't as frequent, so maybe earthquake preparedness is too expensive because it is a relatively low risk. And this is actually a debate that has played out in academic circles in recent years. There's a book, I think, that's on display um, that is um, making the argument that, you know, well, it's asking the question in this article, should Memphis build for California's earthquakes? But it's making the argument that we need to take a prudent approach to earthquake hazard, that resources are scarce and we have to choose whether to spend more to make a building earthquake resilient or you know, to spend the money on something else. And that's a fair point. We can't just go around building every single building to withstand a magnitude eight earthquake. So let's talk, um, and this is the last of the, the, the statements, but let's talk about a cost-benefit analysis for, for earthquake resilience. And let's ask the question, what does it cost? What, what's the extra cost to make a building earthquake resilient? And 
The answer depends on what kind of building you're talking about. So if you're talking about dwellings like this in Hispaniola, the incremental cost to make them earthquake safe, I mean, there's things you can do that make a difference and it's important to try to implement them, but the cost to really, incremental cost to make them really earthquake safe is going to be high because you've got substandard material, substandard design, substandard construction. So, you know, you, you would really need to address all of those to, to make them more resilient. But in a city like Memphis, we're not talking about these sorts of structures. We're talking about buildings that look like this. So what is the incremental cost to, to design them to withstand earthquakes? Um, there was a big study that was done by NIST, the National Institutes of Standards, about five years ago. And this is the worst slide uh, ever. It breaks all the rules. It's just a table, but I'm going to sort of talk through it. What they did was look at different types of commercial structures, apartment, retail, warehouse, hospital, school, and uh, they looked at the cost of designing those buildings to withstand the wind. And it's basically not negotiable. You have to make any commercial building strong enough to withstand the wind because having a building blown over is not um, acceptable. Uh, at the time, this, so this was for Memphis, and so that's defined to be a cost of one. So we're going to look at how much more expensive it would be to design earthquake, um, design buildings to withstand earthquakes. So at the time, Memphis had adopted a local uh, seismic building code, and it, it did require a more stringent construction, and it did add a cost premium that was anywhere from 0.3% up to a high of 2.5%. So that is 0.3 cents on the dollar at up to 2.5 cents on the dollar. And then the cost of, so that's going from wind to the, the current code in Memphis. And then the cost of adopting the national seismic code, which required a higher level of, of design, uh, it did change the numbers. They went up a little bit, but the range is 0.5% up to a high of 2.8%. So we're talking about basically less than three cents on the dollar to make buildings earthquake safe. So there was an old saying in, in earthquake engineering that earthquake resilience of modern structures really isn't that expensive. It's quote, less than the cost of the carpet, which is sort of a surprising um, statement. But if you look at the numbers, uh, carpet's quite expensive. And it does turn out that these premiums for earthquake resilience are less than the cost of the carpet for a commercial structure. So if we're building, I mean, this is a, it's a value judgment and you know, people do have to decide how to spend resources. But if we're building a school or a hospital or an office building today, those are buildings that our grandchildren are gonna be spending time in in the future. And uh, a three cent premium on the dollar um, I don't think is, is an unacceptable investment to make those buildings safe. So I'm personally going to consider that one busted. So, okay, let's see, let's review the list and see which, were, which are facts and which, which are fictions. The Mississippi River ran backwards during the New Madrid earthquakes uh, is, is a fact. Um, church bells rang in Boston during the New Madrid earthquakes, no, and busted is red here. Um, the New Madrid sequence included the largest earthquakes ever witnessed in the contiguous US, no. Um, recent moderate earthquakes in the central US have been caused by fracking, no. But the advent of widespread fracking is responsible for the increase in earthquake activity. Um, and I, I didn't really talk about this. There are things that you can do to mitigate the hazard that have been shown to be very effective uh, in Kansas, for example, and, and more recently in Oklahoma. Um, there's some prudent steps that can be taken to limit the injection rate, uh, to institute, to implement a stop sign system, stop light system, whereby injection is dialed back if you start to see seismic activity near a particular well. And in fact, it, it, it is a hazard that, that you can manage without 
banning the practice altogether. Um, it's not something I really talked about. Um, with the increase in induced earthquake, seismic hazard in Oklahoma is as high as in California. Um, no, you may feel a lot of earthquakes. There may be a, a higher chance of light damage, but the, the potential for really damaging earthquakes is still higher in the West. Uh, seven, okay, earthquakes are not a concern in the central U.S. outside of New Madrid. And then eight, another myth, building resilient structures is too expensive given the low level of earthquake risk in the central United States. So two facts and the rest are fiction. And now I'm going to ask for a show of hands. This is the show me state, right? <laughs> so how many people had six or more right from the start? Okay, excellent. How about, eight? How about seven or more? Let's see a few hands. How about all eight? Anyone? I, I can't even see to the back. Are there any hands up? Anyone have eight? No? Wow. Well, so, I mean, some of them, some of them do get, um, get tricky. And some of them were worded a little bit tricky, so that one's on me. Um, but I wanted to end on sort of a, a kind of a philosophical note that everyone in this room is obviously very interested in, in the natural world, in science, in hazard. You've skipped Thursday night football to, to be here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> but no, seriously, I mean, this is a, an educated, motivated crowd that, you, that you've come here. And the fact that there's still so many enduring myths about earthquakes, to a large extent, that's a failure of my professional community to communicate clearly to members of the public who, in the at the end of the day, are the most important stakeholders that scientists have. Now, um, in our defense, it's gotten to be a noisy world out there. There's a lot of shouting about a lot of things. And so it can be hard to get people's attention to have a, a rational dialogue about issues that are important uh, in, our, in our lives. So, um, I would like to conclude by showing a pretty picture that I, I guess some of you may have seen. Um, and I wanted to say uh, thank you uh, to everyone for showing up tonight, to anyone out there in cyberspace who is, has been listening in and playing along, and la last but not least to the Linda Hall Library for giving scientists like me a chance to come and have a conversation with, with you. Thank you. All right, we have, we have time for some questions. Raise your hand. I'll come by with a microphone. We're uh, videotaping and live streaming, so we want to get the audio on the videotape. I'll, Nick, I'll come over there, start with you. Yeah, you talked a lot about the different magnitudes of earthquakes from one and two, four to seven. And I think it's probably important for people to understand just what that means. The level four magnitude to seven isn't just a small amount. Okay, So can yeah. you explain a little bit to people the difference between the one, the four, seven, eight? Because yeah. I know that it's huge magnet. Uh, yeah, so this is, and, and this is actually covered in the display nicely also that um, a seven is a whole lot bigger than a five. And even a, from a seven to a six, there's a factor of 30 difference in energy release. So these fives, you know, five to a seven, it's a factor of a thousand in energy release. And the scale is what we call logarithmic, uh, which you may remember um, with bad memories from, from your math days, but it just, it just means things go up by a factor of 10 when you go up one unit. So yeah, these, these big earthquakes really are different beasts than moderate earthquakes. Is there a question up? Okay. Well, I'm not a geologist. I really don't know a whole lot about this, but I would assume that the magnitude of the damage from these earthquakes is not only related to the magnitude, but to the 
frequency of the shaking, the mm -hmm. direction of the, the, of the vector forces, and the subsoil composition. So relative to that, if that's correct, what, how does the Midwest here stack up in those terms with the type of earthquakes Oops. it can and will experience versus what happens on the West Coast? You sound like an engineer. Yeah. No, okay. Yeah, no, that shaking is complicated. An earthquake you can think of as like a symphony, that, just, that earthquakes release energy over a range of tones or frequency. And those different tones are going to affect buildings differently. So there's all, I could, you can talk for weeks about the whole issue and what that means. It, in the central US, you get a lot of relatively high frequency shaking. So these, these, what you, um, analogous to high tones in music, they get damped out really quickly in California, like I showed. And so these higher tones, you know, like shaking like this, it travels more efficiently. And so that's why you're feeling these earthquakes at five and a half in Oklahoma, you're feeling it at over a large distance. Um, and that's one of the, and for that Virginia earthquake, it was felt over an enormous distance. That doesn't mean it's damaging over that distance. Um, so, you know, you, in the central US, US, you're definitely gonna feel earthquakes at greater distances. Um, boy, there's, there's so much more to the, the answer that I, I'm not gonna be able to get into, but yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Doctor, I have a question back here by the okay. Taza. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but two days ago we had an election here in Kansas City <laughs> where we passed a, a, a bond essentially to uh, construct a new airport facility. Uh, you gave a comparison of the additional costs for providing earthquake protection for apartment buildings, for hospitals and so on. Can you address uh, what the cost might be for a terminal type building? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, the short answer is I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking it wouldn't be that different from other types of commercial structures. Um, you know, maybe control towers, because you have, if you have something that's tall, it's going to tend to sway. Um, I really don't know. No. Back of the room on your left. Okay. I'm Dr. Ho, you've spent quite a bit of time this evening talking about induced earthquakes, specifically related to fluid injection. Inject the fluid, increase the pore pressure, decrease the effective stress, have an earthquake. You and uh, colleagues in California going to Kern County now just published a paper concerning an interesting situation at an oil field out there. Uh, I think <laughs> folks here might be kind of interested if you could summarize that in a minute or two. Okay, somebody's done their homework. Um. <laughs> I wasn't going to get into that one, but uh, I have looked at earthquakes in California going back over the 20th century. And California was also, you know, big, Los Angeles was a big oil town, other parts of California. And there is evidence that I published a couple papers that some of the bigger earthquakes out there actually were induced by oil production. And in California, we have a lot of active faults. There's a lot of stress on them. And if you start pulling oil out of a, an oil field, overwhelmingly oil production is expected to, if anything, stabilize faults. Because it's the converse of injection. If you're pulling the fluid out, you reduce the fluid pressure on faults, and you actually are predicted to, to prevent earthquakes, if you will. But in a few cases, if you're pulling fluid out, you're perturbing the stress around, and if the wells get deep, as they started to in California, getting down to three kilometers, for example, then you're starting to change the stress in proximity to, uh, in some cases, big faults that might have a lot of stress on them. So I've looked at the, some of these, a couple of these earthquakes, um, looked at the available industry data and present evidence that some of the um, quite large earthquakes, uh, upwards of magnitude seven, might actually have been induced by oil production. Some of my colleagues will be very happy to tell you that I am full of unmentionable stuff. <laughs> Over here on your left, towards the front of the room. Uh, thank you, Doctor. I have a couple of um, things. One, that I, one thing that I read and one thing that I heard, if you could comment on. The thing that I read was that uh, a lot of little earthquakes are better than a big one in these, uh, both related to Oklahoma. So, you know, these small earthquakes kind of inoculate us, kind of like a lot of little wildfires will inoculate us against a big one. Uh, 
And the second one, what I heard from a friend of mine, she, she's not directly involved in the, she lives in Oklahoma, but she's not directly involved in the industry, but she says, to us that shaking just feels like money down here. You know, it's worth the cost, so. <laughs> it, wait, in what sense is it? Uh, because the industry is so br bringing so much to the community that the shock is worth it. Yeah, you know, it, this is, I, I really regret that the debate about induced earthquakes is as polarized as it is. And I've said the same thing to reporters who never use the quote that nobody is pro-earthquake and scientists are not anti-industry, right? I flew here on an airplane, I drive my car all over, you know, it's, and it, somehow the debate is always cast in these terms of, you know, the Cowboys versus the, the Indians, as opposed to a dialogue about what the risk is and how we can, how we can mitigate it. So, um, let's see, that was a bit of a rant. What was your first question? <laughs> a whole lot of little earthquakes, you know, prevent oh, a big one. Yeah, so that definitely does not work in California because the little earthquakes aren't big enough. If you really have stored stress, you've got to have big earthquakes to release it because the big earthquakes are so much bigger. Um, in Oklahoma, it's, it's a trickier question about whether or not it's sort of a safety valve, but there's also a, a fundamental question of whether or not you can generate a really big earthquake. Uh, the magnitude of an earthquake fundamentally reflects how big the fault was that moved and how much it moved. And so you have to have a good sized fault to produce a magnitude seven earthquake. And Oklahoma may just not have faults like that that could host big earthquakes. It's not like California where you have faults that have a lot of stress on them that might be just you know, close to, to going anyway. So uh, the jury's still out on that one um, about, it, it, the question of whether or not it's a safety valve maybe isn't the, the, the important question. It's whether or not you could really have much bigger earthquakes. And there's, there's debates on both sides. Um, Doctor, um, in an ideal world, uh, from, from place to um, uh, place throughout the country, the risk of having a seismic event that exceeded the tolerance of the building code for a particular class of construction would be relatively uniform. In your experience, is that accurate or, or is that a little inconsistent? I'm, that is what they aim for uh, with the building codes to, to sort of have a uniform... My, my question is, are they achieving that? Are they achieving that? Oh boy. I really don't know. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure I even want to speculate on that one. So. All right, we've got a question in the back of the room. I'm slow getting over here. The chart you showed with the increase in Oklahoma and decrease in California, is there any relationship between that? <laughs> Oklahoma has stolen our earthquakes. Um, <laughs> no is, is the, is, it is a pretty easy answer. Um, the number of, of small earthquakes fluctuates quite a bit, even in California. Um, you know, it's higher at some times than others. We debate whether there's any kind of meaning to that. Um, but no, there's, what's going on in Oklahoma doesn't, shouldn't impact what's going on in California. I was wondering, do earthquakes have any long lasting effect upon the, the crust of the earth? In other words, is, is the agricultural purposes of earth uh, affected or? or other aspects of it? Yeah, the, they can have quite a few um, lasting effects. Uh, and you were talking about agriculture? Um, boy, it's, so earthquakes, like the New Madrid earthquakes, uh, can actually change the course of rivers. You created Real Foot Lake. Um, you created all the massive sand blows throughout the Boot Hill region, and um, if you look at aerial photos, you can see those sand blows, but if, when the crops are in season, typically they're blighted because they don't grow as well where you have these sand blows and they were too massive to really remove. Um, in, you, you can have earthquakes cause massive landslides. Um, 
rock falls, that sort of thing. So th the effects on the landscape can be fairly profound. You alluded to the Colorado earthquake as being <laughs> man-made. Was it just a coincidence that it was 24 hours <laughs> from the Virginia earthquake? Oh boy, I wonder about that one. Um, so yeah, where is the figure? This one. So this was August 23rd, uh, 2011. It was quite a large earthquake in Colorado, and then yeah, less than 24 hours later, we had Virginia. I really do wonder about that. Um, we, I, I don't think we're ever going to be able to prove that they were related. But one of the things we do know is that when you have an earthquake, the waves ripple out. And even well beyond where you can feel them, you can still record them with a seismometer. So they're shaking up the crust. And in some cases, that can trigger an earthquake at some distance away. So we use the word trigger if it's natural and then induce if it's man-made. So there have been cases where statistically you can show that, yeah, this earthquake triggered that earthquake over there. Um, it's, if you look at it statistically, it's unlikely that, you, that something that here is going to trigger something this far away. And you're just, I don't think you're ever going to be able to prove that there's a connection. But yeah, I've wondered about that one too. So. Dr. Huff, thank you for the wonderful <laughs> lecture. I know there were still a couple of hands up, but uh, Susan's going to stick around for a few minutes so you can come up and ask your questions. Thank you for attending tonight's program and stay tuned to lindahall.org uh, for updates on our spring programming. Thank you and good night.